for this opportunity. It it is a a blessing to be able to share the gospel in sign language. Did you know that all of you know sign language today? <laughs> now you might not think so, but uh, my father-in-law, who by the way I mentioned, Brother Vernon Miller, who reached those two deaf boys, the very first deaf boys he reached, with Seraphin and Lewis. My father-in-law's name is Seraphin. That's my father-in-law, mm -hmm. and so that's the the power of missions, and so that that's a reminder for me and for my wife as well that you know that's why we're doing what we're doing because. Um, down the road, uh, who knows what God's going to do through the lives of those who, who we reach. But I sure am thankful that God sent Brother Vernon Miller to Peru to reach um, that little deaf boy who would then go on to be my wife's father. So anyway, my father-in-law, Seraphin, he, every time he meets somebody new and uh, he, he wants to get to know him a little bit, he, he says, well, you, you know sign language. And maybe I'm interpreting for him or my wife's interpreting for him. And, We'll, we'll tell the person what he said, and say, no, I don't know sign language. I say, yes, you do. Yes, you do. Uh, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Eat. Eat. That's exactly right. <laughs> you want to give us? You already know sign language. There we go. What, what does this mean? <laughs> Sleep. There we go. Yeah. What, what does this mean? <laughs> Happy. Y'all yeah. already know sign language. This is great. That's the beautiful thing about sign language. It's so visual and so instinctive in many ways mm -hmm. um, that people get a head start on learning it just from the, the, the regular things that they, they see every day. Now, obviously there's more to it than that, but it's a start. And so definitely uh, not out of the realm of possibility, let's put it that way. I don't want you to think of, of sign language like, like, oh, it's like Chinese or Japanese. Mm -hmm. It's something that you could very well learn, at least the basics of If you were to meet a deaf person and have that that reason to try to, to talk to them, you know, go for it. Don't, don't be shy. It's definitely worth it. Mm -hmm. Show you, man that has friends must show himself friendly, right? So hey, who knows? Maybe next week, God prepare in your heart, maybe next week he's going to have you meet that deaf person and you're going to be like, you know what, I can do this. Mm -hmm. I can reach out and say hello and you know, invite them to church. Mm -hmm. But then somebody here would have to learn sign language for real. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, I do always, I do always want to encourage people to use and learn sign language and reach the deaf in their area because mm -hmm. there, there's a need all around the world. And praise the Lord for the deaf ministries that are here in Ontario. I'm not familiar with them, but I, I have heard that there are some, but I don't know where they are. And I just uh, praise the Lord for that. Every country has deaf people in it. Every country, every every city. Uh, I'm sure there are many villages that don't have any deaf people in them, but as any large city will have deaf people, and certainly any any country. Uh, just the statistic that I mentioned in the video, 100,000 deaf people in Peru. That's a, actually a worldwide statistic that I extrapolated from Peru. Sometimes people ask me, why are there so many deaf people in Peru? Well, really, in any country you go to, one out of every 300 people or so will be deaf. Right, and so that's 0.3 percent of the population, to even up to 0.5 on percent on the high end. Uh, but but even on the low end, one out of every 300 people or so will be deaf. And so you will definitely find some towns or cities where you know there might be a thousand people there, and not not one person is deaf. Now that happens certainly, but then you also find some some towns where there's a number of deaf people. It's like how why are there so many deaf people in this little town? Mm -hmm. But um, there are people everywhere that need the Lord. Right. And um, there are subcultures inside of cultures, as you want to put it that way. There are nations and in nations, and the deaf are one, one of them. Let's go in our Bibles to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew and chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, toward the end of the chapter. In verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Now, this is a common thing, a common theme with Jesus Christ. If we saw in the passage we read in Sunday school, Jesus was going about the cities and villages, uh, going about the cities in Galilee and, and, and Decapolis. And now we see here in Matthew, in this passage, Jesus was going about all the cities and villages. 
He was reaching the people where they were at. He was going into the world and preaching the gospel to every preacher. Really, Jesus is the uh, quintessential missionary. Mm -hmm. Sent from heaven above to this earth to reach the lost, to save souls, mm -hmm. to make sure that you and I could have an opportunity to know him. Opportunity to be saved from our sins. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the, the exemplary missionary. And so we see when Jesus went about all the cities and villages, he went, he would teach in their synagogues, their gathering places where the people came together to, to, to study the word of God, to learn about God. And yet the people were lost. And the Bible says that he preached the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom. He preached repentance from sins. He preached that we could know God. He didn't preach in so many words yet about uh, his, his death, burial, and resurrection. But we do see at certain points through the Gospels, he very clearly states that he would be lifted up mm -hmm. and that he would be uh, that he would be killed and that he would rise again on the third day. Mm -hmm. Many times he would put it in not quite so clear phrasing because the people weren't quite ready to hear it in that way. And the people didn't understand. They couldn't wrap their minds around the idea that this was the Messiah. And not only that this was the Messiah, which many of them did believe and recognize, but that the Messiah... Would, would have to die on the cross and then rise again. The people didn't understand that. That wasn't revealed to them completely yet. But he certainly said it time and time again. Mm -hmm. But he preached the gospel. He preached that people could have faith in God mm -hmm. and that God would receive those who came to him in humility, who came to him repenting of their sins like the publican mm -hmm. and be merciful to me a sinner. That's what he preached. Mm -hmm. God be merciful to me a sinner. And that's the gospel God. today. When we come to God, in humility, repenting of our sins, guess what? He won't turn us away. Amen. He'll receive us. He'll forgive us our sins through the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed. That was an essential part of the message, even if people didn't understand that at the time. But he will forgive us. Mm -hmm. Every one of us needs that forgiveness. So he would preach the gospel of the kingdom. He'd go from place to place, preaching the gospel, preaching the kingdom, and not only that, but healing every sickness and every disease among the people. And again, like we said in Sunday school, this was an essential part of his ministry. As Jesus went, he would he would prove that he was who he said he was. He would prove that he was the Messiah. How do we know that you are the Messiah? How do we know that you are sent from God? Because of the wonders that you do, because of the miracles, because of the, of, of the signs and wonders. When Jesus would heal and he would... Uh, when he would heal that deaf man we talked about this morning, when he healed the lepers, healed the sick, that was proof of his love, of his compassion, of his power, of the fact that he was sent from God. No man can do these things of himself, as, as the blind man said who was healed. No man can do these things of himself. No man can do it of, of the devil. The passage right before this, uh, in verse 33, so when, when the devil was cast out, Jesus cast a, de a demon out of a man. The dumb spake, and the multitudes marveled, saying, it was never so seen in Israel. Mm -hmm. And even then the Pharisees, they're trying to turn around and say, no, no, this isn't really the Messiah. Mm -hmm. They said, he casteth out devils to the prince of the devils. Yeah, that's just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. They were trying to make any excuse to say that that he, Jesus, was not from God. And yet he most manifestly was. Mm -hmm. He clearly was sent from God. He did these works, these miracles, out of the love of God. And so when he did these things, again, he was doing them as a foretaste, as as a preview, really, because Jesus didn't heal everyone on the whole planet Earth. There are still people today among us, some of us ourselves, who suffer pain, who suffer difficulties, who suffer, suffer physical handicaps, who cannot hear, who cannot see, who cannot speak. And the truth is that Jesus didn't come to fix this world on our timetable. He can't fix it on his. And the first part of that healing has to be spiritual. Because the root cause of all of this pain and suffering, well, certainly people, can, maybe someone who is born deaf or born blind, or someone who, who even later in life becomes sick, certainly we can't say, well, that's because of their personal sin. That's a consequence. Because all of us have sin, and yet not all of us are in that same boat. Jesus made that very clear when there was a, a man who was lame, uh, I believe it was, and his disciples said, well, who sinned? Whose fault is it that that man can't walk? Was it his fault or was it his parents? Well, the man was born with that issue. How could he have sinned? What did he, like, sin in the womb? 
the God had to happen to him, and yet he was he was in that condition. The Bible says to bring glory to God, and yeah. so we see the two sides of suffering. We see that all of suffering, all of the 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 pain, all of the sorrow we have in this life, certainly does trace its way back to sin. Certainly, it's the corruption of the perfect creation of God. But at the same time, individual cases, many times it's just because God wants to turn things around for His glory. He wants to work in that situation and show how He can heal that. Show how He can turn that around and glorify Himself. Think about Vernon Miller. Think about how much more glory God gets because He did all that with a man who was deaf. Mm -hmm. And think about it. He's not deaf anymore. He's not deaf anymore. And so Jesus, when he would heal the people on this earth, when he would heal every sickness, every disease among the people, he was proving to the people that when he said he could give spiritual healing, mm -hmm. that he really could. Which is easier, as he said to the man who was let down through the roof. You remember that story? Mm -hmm. When, when it, there was a man who couldn't walk, he was paralyzed. And so his friends came, and they took some of the ceiling tiles out, and they let down their friend, on this, this cot, on this bed, they let him down to the roof. And Jesus is sitting there teaching. And all of a sudden, the roof opens up. And the man comes down from the, from the sky, from the roof. And he looks over there. And there's this man who can't walk, can't move. And he says to him, my son, your, your sins be forgiven you. And then everyone around him says, he can't really forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus, what did he say to him? What did he say to him? He said, which is easier? To say your sins be forgiven you, or to say, rise, take up thy bed and walk. Mm -hmm. And so he said, here's the proof. I'm going to show you that I really can do what I say I can do. And then he told him, he said, get up, take up your bed and walk. Jesus healed him outwardly as a proof that he really could heal him inwardly as Amen. well. And as a foretaste that every one of us will experience that healing and glory. So we see here, as Jesus would go about, as he would heal the people, he walked among them. He cared about them. He met them where they were at. He interacted with them. And look at verse 36. When Jesus saw the multitudes, the multitudes are the masses of people. He went to where the people were. And the people came to him as a result of the miracles and the signs and the wonders. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus looked out at them. And the Bible says he was moved with compassion. Again, we see this. He sighed. He had compassion. Jesus was moved with compassion on the people. And why did it touch his heart so much? Why did he care so much? Well, we see that he's healing sicknesses and diseases. So we see that he sees hurting people. He sees physically broken people. But why does the Bible say that Jesus was moved with compassion? The Bible says he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. The Bible says that Jesus looked over the multitudes, and even the people who seemed like they were had it all together, the people who could see, the people who could hear, the people who could speak, even the people who seemed like they had it all together, he saw that inside they were still broken. They were still perishing. They were still scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Now who is the good shepherd? Can anyone tell me who's the shepherd of the sheep? Jesus. It's Jesus. Jesus is the sheep. Jesus is the, I mean, the, the, the good shepherd. Jesus is the shepherd of the sheep. And the Bible says that the Lord is my shepherd. If you're saved today, if you've received Jesus as your Savior, then guess what? You can claim that promise. You can say, I am not fainting, scattered abroad, wandering around with no direction in my life, with no purpose, with no meaning. That's not me. I have a meaning. For my life. My life means something. There's a reason for me to be here. I have direction. I can follow the shepherd. I have provision. I have a shepherd who has the power to provide for my needs and who has the power to protect me. I have a shepherd. And yet Jesus, the shepherd himself, walks among the people. He looks at them He's standing right there. He is the shepherd. And he looks out at the multitudes and it breaks his heart mm -hmm. that the people are fainting and scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And again, as we said this morning, people have to receive them. There's another passage where Jesus says 
the people of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He says, I would have gathered you like a hen gathered her chicks under her wings. I'm just paraphrasing it here. If I would have gathered you here, but you would not. You didn't want, even when Jesus is presented to some people, they reject. And that's their choice. But guess what? There are people who will receive. Mm -hmm. There are people who will come to the shepherd. The harvest is ripe. The fields are ripe under harvest. There are people who will respond to the gospel. But we have to take it to them. The Bible says when Jesus saw the multitudes, not only physically broken, but spiritually broken, when he looked around with spiritual eyes, did you know that Jesus sees people far better than we do, far more clearly? Remember the story of David and, and, and Samuel? And how God told David, when, uh, God told Samuel, when Samuel looked at, at all of David's brothers mm. and said, oh, they look like they'd be great material for kings. They look, he looks like he'd be a strong king. He looks like he'd be a, a great sword fighter. I don't know what. God said, no. Man looks on the outside, but God looks on the heart. And that's still true today. It's easy for us to look at this video and say, wow, those kids really need help. Those kids really need a missionary. They're deaf. They're poor. They, they don't have anybody looking out for them many times. Man, they need somebody to go to Peru and share the gospel with them. But it's easy for us with our human eyes and our, our, our human understanding not to realize that our neighbors are in the same boat and that the people around us are also many times broken spiritually. They're wandering around. They're living an empty, meaningless life. It, I mean, you look at the people who, they're famous people, rich people, who go on to commit suicide, who go on to take their own lives. And the sorrow and the, the brokenness that leads to that, many times people just don't see the purpose in life, the meaning in life. And the truth is, we have a shepherd. We have a meaning, we have a purpose. When Jesus saw the people, he was moved with compassion on them, not only for their physical needs, but he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted. So he saw the need. He had compassion on the need. What are you going to do about it? Sometimes it's easy for us, once we see a need, and once we, we start to get emotional about it, when we realize that we can't really fix it, can't really do anything about it, it's easy for us to just kind of close ourselves off and say, you know what? I'm not going to let it get to me. I'm going to turn a cold heart and a cold shoulder because I can't fix it all. I can't, I can't, can't do anything about it. And the truth is, sometimes I think that we, when we start talking about how much need there is in this world, how many billions of people don't have a Bible, how many, how many millions of people have never heard the gospel, it's easy to want to numb ourselves to that. Because compassion implies pain. It implies it, it implies taking on the burdens of another. It implies actually caring that someone else is hurting. Caring that someone else is suffering. And guess what? That's not fun. It's not fun to hurt for someone else. It's a lot easier just to just to ignore what's happening and just go on a, a carefree, easy, easy going life. That's not what we're called to. We're called to bear one another's burdens. We're called to love one another. And we're called not to turn away from the suffering. You remember that good Samaritan who yeah. saw the, the suffering man on the side of the road? And, and he went over to him and he didn't ignore him like some, some of the more religious folks did. who They, they had talked a good talk, but they didn't really show a little gun. The Samaritan walked over to this man. He saw him hurting. And then he greatly inconvenienced himself. Greatly inconvenienced himself. Went out of his way because he had true compassion. You and I have to learn to see people as Jesus sees them, to care about them as Jesus cares about them, and then to turn around and do what God has for us to do about it. Now, the first thing to recognize is that we cannot do it all ourselves. Mm -hmm. What did Jesus say to his disciples? He did it all this for his disciples, of course. Jesus, he saw the people before they were ever born. He knew what they were going through before they were ever before they even existed. He saw them before time began. <laughs> Jesus didn't have to walk among the people to have compassion on them. He loved them. He loved every one of us before we ever loved him. But he turns to his disciples 
who had been walking alongside him. His disciples, that means you and I. His disciples. And he, he shows them the need. And he shows them his heart, expecting them to get that same heart and that same compassion. And then he says to them, the harvest truly is great. Now we know that the field is the world. The people of this world need to be saved. They need to know the shepherd. The harvest is great. It's plenteous. But the laborers are few. There are not enough people sharing the gospel message. There are not enough people taking the word of God. What will we do about it? Jesus didn't say, so you better work harder. You better get out there. You better do something right now. That wasn't the primary message of this passage. The primary message of this passage is for us to turn our hearts to God. Amen. To get on our knees and beg the Father. Amen. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest. Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, the first missionary, the one sent from God to save this world, telling us to pray to the one who sent him to send forth laborers into his harvest. I mean, don't you find that a little bit interesting? Mm -hmm. That God commands us to pray to him? To ask him to send forth laborers? I mean, honestly, sometimes I, I would look at that and I'd say, well, you know, why are you telling me to ask you for what you already want? Why would you tell me to pray for laborers? Why don't you just, if you want to send them, just send them. You know, that's not a very good way of looking at it, but it, it, it kind of makes sense in its own way. But the truth is that everything we pray for should be what God already wants. Did you know God wants your good? Did you know God's will for you is good and pleasant? Did you know that every good and perfect gift coming from above, from the Father of lights, mm -hmm. as it says in James chapter 1? Mm -hmm. Did you know that God's will for you is good? All things work together for good mm -hmm. to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. If you know that, then you know that really everything we pray for, everything we want, we shouldn't want anything if it's not already what God wants. Trust me, if God doesn't want it to happen, if God doesn't want it for you, then you'd be better off without it. And if God wants it for you, then you should want that. Prayer isn't about us kind of letting God know what should happen. Prayer is about us getting on the same page as God and opening up our hearts and kind of like synchronizing ourselves with God. Yes. Saying, your will be done. In fact, the Bible even says that when we pray and it's not according to his will, he's not going to do it. Mm -hmm. If we ask anything according to his will, he will do it. Amen. If we ask anything according to his will. So when Jesus commands us to pray for people to reach this world for Christ, guess what? It's his will. Mm -hmm. And he wants us to pray for it, not because he has, because he thinks that God's not going to do it. He wants us to pray for it because he wants, God wants to do it through us. Yeah. He wants us to love people. He wants us to be his choice servants. He wants us to see the need. He wants us to have compassion. And he wants us to be on our knees in fellowship with him, walking with him every day with a broken heart, crying out to him to reach this world for him. Trust me, he has a plan. Where there's a will, there's a way. Yeah. He has a plan to reach this world. Are you crying out to the Father? If Jesus was sitting here today, that would be his prayer request. For him. That's that's his documented prayer request right here. Y'all get together for, for prayer meetings. I don't know, perhaps your Wednesday nights, your prayer meeting. Uh, and, and everybody raises their hand and says, would you pray for this? Would you pray for that? Would you pray for the other? If Jesus was sitting right here, he would care about all of that. He certainly would. Amen. But you know what his prayer request is in this passage? After seeing all the sick and all the all the all the needy, his prayer request for this world is pray for God to send forth more laborers. That's his prayer request. For more people to be preaching the gospel. Now let me ask you something. If you are begging the Father sincerely, with a true heart, because you've seen the need, because you care about it, because you love people, because God loves them. Then I don't think you'll be ready to do something about it. Man. When God moves you to act, 
I think you'll be ready to give out that gospel tract, to invite that person to church, to get out there and give that cup of cold water in Jesus' name, and, and say, I love you because Jesus loves you. Let me help you. Because you know that Jesus can save you. If, you. if you really care, look at verse 1 of chapter 10. Jesus saw the need. Jesus cared about the need. And Jesus told us to look above for the solution. Not to ourselves, but look above to the solution of the need. Mm -hmm. And then it, we see what happens. And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, Jesus got them all together. And he says, now, in my power, go. Amen. Go and preach the gospel. Go and reach people. And as we see in the rest of the passage, I won't read it here, but he sent them to specific people and to specific places. He didn't tell them to go to other places and other people. But he gave the direction. He gave them power. And they went out and they reached people for God. You and I, trust me, God wants you to reach somebody. God wants you to do something for him. Your life has a purpose. It has a meaning. And we already read in the book of Mark the Great Commission. So let's close tonight with the Great Commission of the book of Matthew. We already saw Jesus' prayer request for there to be more laborers. Now we're going to see Jesus' command. In Matthew 28, 19, and 20. I'll we'll start with verse, eight, verse 18 because that's the most important part is God's power. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All power, all authority. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. Jesus is with you. Right now, if you Amen. are in Christ, Christ is in you. And he's with you always, even unto the end of the world. And I like that right there. At the very end of the whole passage. Amen. Amen. That's not even in red there. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's not what Jesus said. That's what the gospel author, inspired through the Holy Spirit, had to say about the fact that Jesus is with us all the time. Amen. Amen. Well, if we're going to go in God's power, with his presence, with his provision, mm -hmm. then guess what? Amen. Mm -hmm. We can do something for God. We can do something for God. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor.